In the vast tapestry of biblical stories, there are numerous examples of individuals devoted to God. However, among these accounts, some stand out not only for their unwavering faith, but also for their willingness to sacrifice everything for the gospel. This is the saga of Stephen, the pioneer martyr of Christianity. In the book of Acts, chapter 6, we are introduced to Stephen, a man whose name means crown in Greek, an allusion to his eventual crowning in eternity. He is described as an individual deeply committed to God, overflowing with faith and the Holy Spirit. Stephen was a Hellenist, a Jew born outside of Israel, whose lingua franca was Greek. He lived in Jerusalem and, upon encountering Christianity, joined the early church. However, the Hellenists began to complain that their widows were being neglected compared to the local Hebrews. In response to this issue, the apostles convened the congregation and, recognizing the importance of mutual care, delegated the responsibility to the church. It was decided that seven men would be chosen to manage this concern. They were to be individuals imbued with faith and the Holy Spirit, ready to serve and lead with integrity. The Apostles' proposal resonated with all the brothers, and they elected seven men full of faith and the Holy Spirit to take on this important responsibility. Among these chosen, Stephen stood out as a man whose faith overflowed, recognized as the first Christian martyr. His journey not only offers a glimpse into life in the early church, but also serves as an inspiring example of what faith in Christ can accomplish. The book of Acts chapter 6 verses 1 to 7 recounts the events of those days when the number of disciples was constantly growing. The Hellenistic Jews among them began to express discontent with the Hebrew Jews, noticing that their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. Faced with this challenge, the twelve apostles gathered all the disciples and emphasized that it was not right to neglect the ministry of God's word to resolve material issues. Thus, they proposed that seven men from the community, known for their fullness of spirit and wisdom, be chosen to take over the administration of this task. This way they could fully dedicate themselves to prayer and teaching the word. The proposal was widely accepted, and the seven men were selected. Stephen, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas of Antioch, a convert to Judaism. The apostles prayed over them and laid their hands on them, and thus the word of God spread, and the number of disciples in Jerusalem grew rapidly. Even a large number of priests became obedient to the faith, witnessing the transformative impact of the dedicated service and inspiring leadership of these men filled with the Holy Spirit. Once the selection was completed, the seven newly chosen were presented before the apostles, who laid their hands on them and prayed for them. The result of this act of ordination was more effective care for the widows, allowing the apostles to devote more time to their ministerial work. As a direct result, the word of God began to grow, and a significant increase in new disciples was witnessed throughout Jerusalem. There have always been faithful believers whose love for God and devotion to the Lord shone so intensely that they captured the attention of those around them. And Stephen was one of these individuals. Although little is known about his personal life, his parents, siblings, wife or children, what is essentially known about him is his unwavering commitment to the faith. Stephen's new role did not prevent him from continuing to serve the elderly and the widows. He used his position to demonstrate signs and wonders, performing miracles among the people. Moreover, he faced challenges in his faith with wisdom granted by God, guided by the Holy Spirit. Amid his growing responsibilities, Stephen remained an example of compassionate service and fervent devotion, lighting the way for others to follow towards true faith. Now Stephen, overflowing with divine grace, blessing, favor, and power, was performing wonders and extraordinary signs, thus witnessing the miracles among the people. However, even in the face of these divine manifestations, Stephen encountered opposition. He became the target of people conspiring to defame his reputation and cause turmoil. 
the men who opposed him soon realized that his wisdom, derived from the Holy Spirit, surpassed them in every debate. Consequently, they decided to resort to false accusation, labeling Stephen as a blasphemer and imprisoning him. In an attempt to more subtly tarnish his reputation, they secretly instructed some men to testify that Stephen had uttered blasphemous and slanderous words against Moses and God. These false accusations stirred up the people, as well as the elders and scribes. Stephen was then seized and brought before the Sanhedrin, the highest Jewish court, where false witnesses were presented to confirm their accusations. They claimed that Stephen was preaching against the temple and the law of Moses, even suggesting that he foresaw the destruction of the temple and the alteration of traditions passed down by Moses. The conspiracy plotted against Stephen resulted in his arrest and his presentation before the council of the Sanhedrin in the synagogue. He was accused of blasphemy, and during the trial, false witnesses were summoned to corroborate the accusations. Before the high priest and the council, Stephen was questioned about the veracity of the charges against him. However, instead of denying or contesting the accusations, he saw the opportunity as a moment to share the gospel of salvation in front of all present. The account in Acts chapter 7 presents us with Stephen's powerful testimony. He explained how God had faithfully fulfilled the promises made to Abraham over the centuries. Stephen also highlighted Jesus as the ultimate fulfillment of these divine promises. Furthermore, Stephen exposed the hardness of heart of the members of the Sanhedrin, who stubbornly resisted the conviction of the Holy Spirit, following in the footsteps of their ancestors, who also resisted the prophets who announced the coming of Jesus. In his speech, Stephen took a journey through sacred history, recalling the devout patriarch Abraham, the journey of his people from Joseph to the liberation led by Moses. He highlighted Moses' encounters with God, especially at the burning bush in the desert of Midian, and how God empowered Moses to lead his people out of slavery and idolatry towards freedom and the promise of the land. Throughout his speech, Stephen constantly reiterated the ongoing rebellion and idolatry of the people, despite the mighty works of God of which they had been eyewitnesses. He confronted them with their own history, an accusation that deeply irritated them, leading them to no longer want to hear. Stephen was not concerned with his own earthly safety. His determination was to stand firm alongside Jesus Christ, regardless of the consequences. God inspired him to speak boldly and clearly, accusing Israel of not recognizing Jesus as their Messiah and rejecting him, just as they had done with the devout prophets, including Zechariah, over the generations. Stephen's speech was an indictment against Israel and its failure as God's chosen people, who received the law, the sacred things, and the promise of the Messiah. Then the high priest asked, Are these accusations true? And Stephen said, Brothers and fathers, listen. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Haran. God said to him, Leave your land and your relatives, and go to the land I will show you. So Abraham left the land of the Chaldeans and went to Haran. After his father died, God brought him to this land where you now live. But he gave him no inheritance here, not even a foot of ground. However, he promised to give him possession of this land and his descendants after him, even though Abraham had no children at the time. God said that his descendants would be foreigners in a land that would enslave and oppress them for four hundred years. But I will judge the nation that enslaves them, God promised, and afterward they will come out and serve me in this place. Then God established the covenant of circumcision with Abraham, Abraham fathered Isaac, who was circumcised on the eighth day. Isaac fathered Jacob, and Jacob fathered the twelve patriarchs. The patriarchs, full of envy, sold Joseph to Egypt. But God was with Joseph and delivered him from all his troubles, granting him favor and wisdom in the presence of the king of Egypt, who appointed him governor over all of Egypt and his household. Later, 
A great famine struck Egypt and Canaan, and our fathers found no sustenance. When Jacob heard that there was food in Egypt, he sent our fathers there the first and second time. Joseph was finally recognized by his brothers, and Joseph's family was presented to Pharaoh. Joseph then called his father Jacob and all his relatives a total of 75 people. Jacob went down to Egypt, where he died, as did our fathers. Their bodies were taken to Shechem and placed in the tomb that Abraham had bought from the sons of Hamer in Shechem. When the time of the promise that God had sworn to Abraham approached, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt until a new king arose who did not know Joseph. This king treated our ancestors harshly and oppressed them, forcing them to expose their babies so they would not survive. At that time, Moses was born and was pleasing to God. He was raised in his father's house for three months. When he was exposed, Pharaoh's daughter adopted him as her own son and educated him as an Egyptian. Moses, however, was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and became powerful in words and deeds. When Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit his brothers, the children of Israel. Seeing one of them being mistreated, he defended him and avenged him by killing the Egyptian who was oppressing his brother. Moses thought his brothers would understand that God was liberating them through him, but they did not understand. The next day Moses saw two Israelites fighting and tried to reconcile them, saying, You are brothers, why are you harming each other? But the aggressor said, Who made you leader and judge over us? Do you intend to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? When Moses heard this, he fled to the land of Midian, where he lived as a foreigner and had two sons. Forty years later, an angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in a flame of fire in a bush in the desert of Mount Sinai. Moses was amazed at the sight and approached to take a closer look. Then the Lord's voice spoke to him, saying, I am the God of your forefathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses trembled with fear and dared not look. But the Lord said to him, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. I have seen the oppression of my people in Egypt and have heard their groaning. I have come down to deliver them, and now I am sending you to Egypt. This Moses, whom the Israelites rejected, saying, who made you a leader and a judge, is the same one whom God sent as a leader and liberator through the angel who appeared to him in the bush. He led them out of Egypt after performing signs and wonders in the land of Egypt at the Red Sea and in the desert for forty years. This is the Moses who said to the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your own brothers. He was in the assembly in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai, and he received living words to pass on to us. But our ancestors refused to obey. They rejected Moses and in their hearts turned back to Egypt, saying to Aaron, Make us gods who will lead us, for we do not know what has happened to Moses, the man who brought us out of Egypt. In those days they made a golden calf and offered sacrifices to idols, rejoicing in the work of their own hands. Then God turned away and gave them over to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. Did you offer me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness for forty years, house of Israel? But I rebuke you for taking up the tabernacle of Molech and the star of the god Rephan, the images that you made to worship. I will send you into exile beyond Babylon. Our forefathers had the tabernacle of the testimony in the desert, as God had instructed Moses to build it according to the pattern he had seen. This tabernacle was brought to the land by our forefathers when they took possession of the nations that God drove out before them. Thus, the tabernacle remained in the land until the days of David, who found favor before God and asked to be allowed a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built a house for him. However, the Most High does not live in houses made by human hands. As the prophet says, Heaven is my throne, and the earth is the footstool of my feet. What kind of house will you build for me? says the Lord. Or where will my resting place be? Did not my hand make all these things? You, 
with your stiff-necked hearts and uncircumcised ears, are always resisting the Holy Spirit. Just like your forefathers, you too have persecuted and killed the prophets who foretold the coming of the Righteous One, of whom you have now become betrayers and murderers. You received the law that was given through angels, but have not obeyed it. These accusations, although true, were not well received by the Jews. Upon discovering the indignation of the others, they deemed Stephen guilty of blasphemy according to Mosaic law. Blasphemy was punishable by death, usually by stoning. Mosaic law clearly stipulated that those who blasphemed against the Lord should be cut off from among their people, excluded from the atonement made for them, for they had despised and rejected the word of the Lord, violating his commandments. An example of this strictness occurred in the wilderness when the Israelites found a man gathering wood on the Sabbath. When brought before Moses, Aaron, and the entire congregation, God commanded that he be stoned to death outside the camp, as instructed to Moses, Numbers chapter 15 verses 30 to 36. Shortly before the Sanhedrin carried out the prescribed punishment, Stephen's final moments on earth were recorded for posterity. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard his words, they were filled with rage and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and beheld the glory of God with Jesus standing at the right hand of God. I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God, he proclaimed. At this confession, they covered their ears and in a deafening uproar dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. As the stones fell upon him, Stephen prayed to the Lord Jesus, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then, kneeling down, he cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And after these words, he fell asleep surrendering his life into the hands of the Lord. Acts chapter 7 verses 54 to 60. Verses 2 and 3 of the third chapter of Colossians describe Stephen's life perfectly. Set your mind and habitually focus on the things above, the heavenly things, not on things that are on the earth, which have only temporary value, for you have died to this world, and your real new life is hidden with Christ in God. The life and especially the death of Stephen serve as an example for every believer committed to the Lord. Even in the face of death he remained faithful, courageously preaching the gospel, aware of God's power and willing to be used by him for his plan and purpose. Stephen's testimony continues to shine as a beacon, a light in a dark and dying world. Stephen exemplified a deep commitment to Christ. He shows us that leadership goes beyond the mind and emotions, reaching into the will. True commitment is manifested when the mind and emotions are firmly established, regardless of the cost. Leaders cannot expect their followers to make deeper commitments than they do themselves. To build genuine commitment, we must first understand some fundamental truths. Commitment number one begins in the heart. Commitment paves the way for achievements. We have to look inside where our hearts are committed. Commitment number two is tested by action. The only real measure of commitment is action. Talking about commitment is cheap. Action is costly. Commitment number three precedes achievement. Once you commit, all blessings come your way to help you succeed. Commitment number four can be measured. Leaders must assess themselves to measure their commitment. Commitment number five helps a leader make decisions. Leaders must determine what is worth dying for and then make that the basis for their decisions. Commitment number six promotes accountability. Make your commitments public so that you have an incentive to follow through. The story of Stephen reminds us that true commitment to God goes beyond mere words. It demands action, determination, and a willingness to sacrifice everything for the kingdom. May this account inspire us to reflect on our own lives and commit ourselves more deeply and authentically to God's purpose for us. May every step we take be permeated by the commitment to honor and glorify the Lord's name in everything we do. May we be like Stephen, firm and unshakable in our faith, facing challenges with courage and confidence, always seeking to live according to God's will.
May this story motivate us to pursue a life of radical commitment to Christ, knowing that, like Stephen, our life and testimony can profoundly impact the world around us. May Stephen's commitment inspire our own commitment to God, guiding us in our journey of faith and leadership. May we move forward with determination, confidence and courage, knowing that, with God by our side, we are more than conquerors. Father, we thank you for life and the gift of salvation. We pray for an unwavering commitment to you to keep your word at all times and proclaim your glory. We pray for your grace to live a life of holiness.